push it here. It's recording now. Yes. Thank you. Well, we were riding to one of the faraway places and I saw people walking as far away as you could see, pushing carts or riding bicycles with those big jerry cans. And <clears throat> they were all coming to one little hole. And I asked if we could stop and, and look. And way deep down in that one little hole was dirty water. And people were coming every day to get enough to survive. So I listened to the stories and looked at the faces. And we got back in the car and continued our trip. And I, I said, this cannot be God's plan. Even though I was only a boy, I can still recall that one evening service at our church. There was a lady there that I had never seen before, dressed in colorful and exotic clothing. She was invited to the front to speak and began to tell of a people far across the ocean that were much different than anyone I had ever met. These people didn't have the money for toys or comforts, or to my surprise, even some basic necessities. Changamoto ambazo tulikuwa nazo nyingi sio ndogo ila zilienda zinapungua pungua tulikuwa shida ya maji tulikuwa shida ya kanisa My heart started to feel moved but I must have only been about 10 or 11 years old I had no idea what I could do to help them She then mentioned how the children were once given stickers and how they immensely enjoyed them I decided that was something I could help with. I walked up to the lady after the service and got her help to mail some stickers to Africa. Many months later, I received a rough envelope covered with stamps. It was a note of thanks from across the sea, saying that the children very much enjoyed the stickers. It was signed by Pastor Conrad Bitoy. Years passed and my attention turned to other things as I grew. I was unaware that a miracle was occurring across the ocean, or that one day, 15 years later, I would have the privilege of sharing with you this story. I don't remember ever thinking once in my whole life that I hope I get to travel someplace for missions overseas. In fact, yeah, I just don't remember once ever feeling called to missions. What I was doing is I was at a career that I loved at the Intermediate School District coordinating preschool. My grandchildren had moved close enough for me to be able to visit them more often. They were in Chicago at Great Lakes. I'm hoping I'm making a recording, but I can't see because the sun is so bright. And I was far from financially ready to retire. So I was introduced to a man at a funeral dinner who works in Papua New Guinea. And <clears throat> he invited me to come along with him on a trip because they needed disability expertise. And I said, oh, absolutely not ever. There's no way that I'm 
thinking that's part of my life. And I remember watching a video of this man's previous trip, and there were twins who were physically impaired, had a physical impairment, and the parents were talking about what that was like and their challenges. And I was in a group of quite a few people, and I said, oh, I know that story. Those stories come to my desk on a regular basis here. And I was so appalled that I left and drove home because now my excuse of what could I offer, that's gone. I actually wept all the way home. And there was just this huge shift in my thinking, oh, maybe I'm supposed to do this. I still had no sense of a desire to do it, but perhaps a stronger invitation. Restore antique clocks. This one's a completely restored one. They look like they get done. So how long have you been doing with it? Just about 60 years. Gonna get, there was something, someone needed something. I can't remember, maybe it was a vehicle or whatever. And I thought about it and I thought, well, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be generous here. And I'm gonna give $200. And immediately, God interrupted that. And he says, 500, you give $500. And I, I backed away and I said, no, no, that's not right. That's, that's too much, that can't be right. You know, I, I didn't dream that it was God. I thought it was, I didn't know what it was. And not long after we were at our 15 year celebration of a Bible study group, and a lady who no longer even lived near here came back for that celebration. And she said to me, every time I drive by your house, God tells me to give you this portion of my tithe from my parents' inheritance. It was $3,000. And she said, it's for your ticket to Papua New Guinea. And the ticket was 3080 at that point, at that time. And it took me about two weeks to come up with that $500. I mean, I finally decided because I, because, you know, I couldn't get rid of it. Mm -hmm. So I put the 500 in. It happened about four times. And I remember saying to her, I did not say thank you or bless you. I said, oh no, I have to go. And then the last time, uh, I was giving to a group that was buying Bibles, you know, to distribute. And I thought I was doing pretty well giving a hundred dollars. I mean, you know, a hundred dollars, most people don't put a hundred into in the Bible, you know, thing. Mm -hmm. And God said, uh, now that I know it's God, he says, uh, put a thousand in. And I didn't even question it. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, I told God, okay, I'll put my hundred in, I'll put 900 in out of your money. <laughs> That's just what I said or thought. So that was the last time I think he figured that I was trained. <laughs> <laughs> and so God removed both my feeling I wasn't have anything to offer and the financial peace in such unmistakable ways that I knew this I, I knew without a doubt, oh, I have to go. I have to go.
I remember very much. I remember I was at uh, the Bible College and uh, I started very much and I was so happy. When I was there, uh, we were given something I can say like a test. I and other pastors, we were told that uh, everyone in order to graduate, he or she must plant a church, two churches in a village, or one church in town. While Carol was working that day, it was July 4th, 2005, about one o'clock, and I was sitting in that chair and I was, we were, had already decided that I was retiring early. I had heard about this place in Arkansas. Uh, an enclosed village had its own Walmart just across the street and everything. It was, it was the nation's largest uh, uh, area like that. It had like eight lakes and seven golf courses. The challenge was uh, buildings. Many, many of the church I was planting were worshiping outside and the trees shady like this. So we had been there and we looked at some houses and I thought, well, you know, this, we can do this. And Carol had been after me because she didn't like the cold. She says, I, I want to go, I want to move south in the winter, you know. And I told him, uh, my principal, I have now a new church, two churches in the village and one church in town, but I'm so sad. I don't know how we will get church buildings. He told me to keep playing, and he told me that he will be playing also with me. I was getting ready to retire in that chair. I mean, I was getting everything worked out in my mind, and I was, thought I'd be done. Less than a year, I'd be, we'd be done. And, uh, just out of the blue, uh, I heard this voice speaking. God said, uh, you are to build churches. That's, that was a strange, I, mean, I thought, I don't even like to tell people that because it sounds so strange. Mm -hmm. Sounds strange to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I sit there for a second and I says, no. I said, no, I'm, I'm all done. I, I, I'm retiring. You know, I'm, I'm all done. And I stood up right there, you know. And God came back again. And he said, uh, I care not only for the people in your country, but I care for the souls of men everywhere. So what that, what that did for me is told me that I wasn't going to build churches here. Mm -hmm. so, so that was the end of that. And then I was thinking of how I was going to get out of it. <laughs> So there was a kind of struggle to accept that. What's that? There was kind of a struggle to accept that. I think anybody'd have trouble, wouldn't they? Yes, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. And how long did you say it took you to kind of to fight through that before you lost that one? A couple hours, <laughs> two or three. When Carol got home, it was all over. Mm -hmm. I had to go tell her. Of course, I wondered. I really wondered what in the world is she going to say? She's wanting this place down there. And I told her, okay, we'll go, and now we're not going. Mm -hmm. Can't go, can't go both places and do this, do it all, do everything. So I told her about it. I said, what do you, what do you think about that? And she says, I think we ought to do it. So it's 50% her, her doings too. You know, without her, we couldn't have done it. I think I was working that day and I came home and they told me. Mm -hmm. And so I was kind of surprised that this was going on. And he says you were very supportive of the idea. Oh yeah, oh yeah. People in our church need to be supportive of each other, and especially husband and wife. I didn't talk to Russ, but from, his, from her response, it seemed like he's really happy to talk. After filming Jerry's interview, we had the chance to sit down with Pastor Russ Atherton, who was pastoring in Everett when all of this began. He was currently enjoying some time off at Manton Christian Camp. 
I was touched by the lovely and tranquil atmosphere of the campground. It felt like the perfect backdrop for recalling this story about how God had built his kingdom. We asked Russ a few questions about his experience with Jerry and how the partnership with Tanzania came about. And I probably would have to confess that there were probably times he came in, you know, and had these ideas, and I'm thinking, I don't want to discourage him, but, you know, that, that sounds a little far, but <laughs> yeah. sometimes we just have to open up and say, okay, yeah. So, there, yeah, there was a lot of God stuff going on. The church in Everett, uh, the pastor's office is right at the main entry. And uh, the window to, to my office looked out over the driveway that, that came in and the carport that people would park under as they were uh, unloading their cars coming into church. And uh, I was in my office there. I remember studying. I can't tell you the exact day, but I can remember... Uh, a car pulling in, and it was one of our guys, uh, uh, Jerry Reedy, uh, fairly quiet fellow. And uh, when he came in, our, our church was always mission-minded, and uh, we had pretty much focused on our church stuff. And Jerry came in and, and started talking specifically about Africa. And uh, um, you know, at first I was a little nervous, I suppose, but. Um, one thing that I've learned in ministry is you never want to discourage anybody um, from something they sense God is calling them, calling them to do. Of course, part of the call of God is that it's always going to be in line with everything that God is doing. You know, if somebody gets a sense that God is calling them to do something that doesn't quite fit in line, um, we want to look at that very, very carefully. And so when Jerry came in, you know, I'd I didn't know exactly where it was coming from on that. And so the, the first part of it was to, to hear his story. You know, it was the kind of thing that God really settled it on his, on his mind. And that's often the way God does a call, you know, that there's so many things going on in the world, so many areas, directions you can get pulled. And uh, this was a very definite direction that Jerry was being pulled. I wanted to find out, you know, what I, where I was supposed to get started. Mm -hmm. I mean, it took several months. I knew Gerald Barraza, that's who I sent the books to. And uh, I, I think I asked him, I says, do you need any churches built there? You know, and he says, well, he said, yes. I, he said, I've got, a, I've got a good pastor here, Pastor Conrad, that's who it was. He said, uh, he will be the leader of the Free Methodist Church, is what he told me. Mm. He said, he's, he'll, I think he'll be the leader of the Free Methodist Church and, and he, could, he could badly use a, a building. I received a phone from some missionaries who were living in Tanzania. The names were Stillmans. They found me and told me the good news. I was amazing. They told me, oh, Pastor Conrad, you have good news for you. We have funds for, to, for helping you with, the, with building church, especially the one you planted in Gator Town. I didn't believe that. Conrad wrote me back, he says, he, I remember one, one of his statements was, I never, I never thought I'd ever hear from anybody in America. <laughs> so I talked to him, I says, uh, you probably need more churches, do you? And he said, yes, we do. And I says, well, I says, what? Well, these are the ground rules I want to lay out. I says, I'm going to send, I want you to figure out what the cost is. And I will send the amount to you. And you distribute it. I says, I'm willing to pay a few people to work on it, but I, the, I want the people that are getting the church to help with the labor, to do a lot of the labor. I said, I realize that you need a few skilled people and you'll have to have, there'll have to be some payment to them. So that's the way we set it up. And it worked, it worked very well. About three months after I came home, I was invited to go to Ethiopia. And I said, no, God's called me to Papua New Guinea. 
And so I went to Ethiopia for three trips. And I was planning a third trip. And Gerald, my cousin, said, well, you're going to be really near on your safari where I've started to partner with Pastor Conrad. So that is how I got introduced to the idea of going to Tanzania. I asked for a picture of what you were doing when I was visiting, and you said, I don't really have much. And I said, I'll go get you pictures. So I didn't have any idea what that meant. And then Barb Stillman, I finally got a hold of her, and she said, it will be a really hard journey. And so she essentially said, if I were you, I wouldn't do that. And so I came to tell you that. And before I could say anything, you said, God told me to give you this money for the airfare difference between where you're going to be and where Pastor Conrad is. And you said, I told God I was done giving this year. But he said, give her this. And I immediately didn't like you very much because I was like, I can't say no now. And I came here to tell you it was too hard and I wasn't going to go. And and you, you should not like me. I'm not, I'm, I was just a messenger. In 2008, also, I received a phone from same missionaries telling me, Pastor Conrad, there is one lady from in the U.S. She wants to uh, get to communicate with you and she wants to visit you. It's amazing to me. One lady from the U.S. I went with a team to West Africa. We had been to Nigeria and Ghana and done trainings. And then they went back home and I flew to Tanzania to do, go on safari with my aunt and her son who lived there. That's how this whole thing got started. And we did the safari, and then from there I flew along to Mwanza. And Pastor Conrad met me there along with Laban, who was going to interpret, and the, the leader of the Tanzanian church, Joseph, I think. I didn't know who I was looking for, but Pastor Conrad arrived with my name on a cardboard <laughs> because he could tell me I'm the only white person that got off there, but... I thought, I will not know him, and I'm not going with someone. I don't know who they are. So that's how we met. So we started walking in downtown Mwanza, and I realized Pastor Conrad doesn't speak English. My English also was not much. Very, very little. And Laban had written, helped him write the emails. So that was really one big jolt to me because I was going to his home mm -hmm. and expecting some small communication. <clears throat> when I arrived at Conrad's, there were many people waiting to greet me, mm -hmm. singing worship songs and songs of joy. And I was so, they ran ahead of the car that we rode in and 
When we got to the house, I was so tired, I couldn't stay up to be with anybody. And I just fell asleep to the sounds of, not hundreds, but many people singing right outside the window. We are going to the church. So what I saw with the churches, except for the one that Conrad was pastoring, there were piles of bricks, <clears throat> benches, a few had ragged tarps over them, not all. And they explained to me they're building the bricks themselves as they can, trusting that someday there will be a way to get a roof and then they'll have a church. And so that was my focus. And then part of what I did as, as a pastor uh, on the organizational end of things was to make sure um, that this wasn't kind of a wildcat situation, you know, that we would go through all the right channels uh, so that all the safeguards were being met and all the uh, uh, appropriate attentions uh, were being paid. I could tell right away that he was 100% genuine and, and uh, I've told several people that I could trust every dime I have with him and he would never touch it. I believe the second or third church we did, Conrad wrote me and told me that this family, they, you know, they've, they, they don't have a house and it's going to be very difficult for them to, to pastor the church without a house. So we had to build that house separately. I think we did one other one separately. And then I wrote Conrad and I says, I said, it'd be far, far more economical to put a few rooms on the back of the church instead of having to build two separate things. So after that point, every church had a, had a family, had living quarters. Hmm. How many churches now? In Tanzania, at least 25. That's amazing. None of this was separate from passion from the people getting to know Jesus. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I want to make sure I emphasize that because that's what Jerry would emphasize. You know, how can we make it as easy and as productive as possible for these people to hear about Jesus? And, uh, and so that, that was always the driving motivation behind him. Jerry remained incredibly humble while recording his interview. He neglected to mention the extent of his donations or how they were for churches and wells and even preschools. But by his willingness to help and by his willingness to humbly share what God had worked through him to do, it became clear that this was not simply the work of a man donating money. But I remember when I was 17 years old, having a dream and, uh, that, and I was told that I'd be helping thousands of people. Wow. Never thought much more about it. It didn't necessarily mean Africa, but that's what I, but I, I never forgot it. Yeah.
I saw people were much thinner in December. It was the only time I went in December, so I thought it might just be that's how their food cycle is. And I asked, and Pastor Conrad said the crop failed, and so people are hungry. And Joel I had met at Higher Ground. He's an agronomist, and I learned from him that means someone who knows how to grow things. So I wrote him a letter, and Joel's reply was, Ah, oh, I did training for Farming God's Way in Kenya, and my hope was to learn Swahili and go back. And I said they speak Swahili in Tanzania. He didn't learn Swahili, but that fit. Joel Clifton currently resides in the state of Ohio, making a face-to-face -face interview with him kind of impractical. So Deb and I set up an interview with him over Zoom uh, to get his side of the story. Uh, so Farming God's Way is a biblical management technique which increases crop production. Um, through modeling farming after God's creation. So for example, uh, in nature, there's no soil disturbance. Um, there's no tillage. So farming God's way encourages no plowing. Um, and, and it has a permanent mulch layer, which is called God's blanket in the program. And planting a diversity of, of crops through crop rotation. Driving there, they drive on the wrong side of the road. <laughs> and traffic laws are kind of not even paid attention to. So I thought I was going to die on the way there. <laughs> um, but then, yeah, just seeing seeing the level of poverty in, in a totally different light um, that they have. The uh, But also at the same time, I was met by some um, very encouraging, very happy people, very godly people um, at the Bible College and through connections there. So I think in the midst of all of the, the lack, there's still a lot of joy and a lot of happiness. There were some road bumps. <laughs> and some hurdles to get over. Uh, we had some technological difficulties. Uh, I was thinking that I would be able to do more with with a computer than what I was able to. But it, it really worked out in the end because of just how much uh, support and planning there was ahead of time by um, Pastor Conrad. Part of Farming God's Way isn't just a classroom. It's going out into the field and actually doing um, doing what they're being taught. So we were out there digging holes and planting seeds and watering. And we were able to incorporate a few other things, um, some, some skits and some side lessons that I felt were applicable to farming. And that really helped with their energy because they love the skits. Yeah, they, they love visual and they love participation. Sitting in a classroom all day um, isn't probably a lot of people's <laughs> ideal way to learn. So, you know, the more hands-on we could get get them involved, the better. I'll ask you this right now. What is What moment in particular stands out from the whole process in in Tanzania as your favorite memory what was what was a really high point in that journey i would say at the end when we had a um as kind of a mini graduation ceremony <laughs> um we we had certificates printed off with each person's name and handed them out to each individual who took the class and there were 40 people in the class wow. um and there was a full-on celebration with singing and dancing and everything
Um, they were overjoyed to have been able to be there and to take the class and to learn valuable lessons. And I believe most of them have actually incorporated those techniques and, and lessons into their farming practices. Also, Tarifa Ilempia. Ndiyo. Mufano wenyewe ni huu. Unaweza ukalima shamba dogo kwa kutumia mafuzo tulio ya pikia ukapata mazao mengi kuliko ile ya kwangu nalima sehemu kubwa unapata mazao kidogo. Pastor Conrad um, sent us photos over the course of the following growing season of their corn plots. It was just incredible the amount of difference that they saw in yields, in the health of the plants, in the height of the plants, in the um, lack of weed pressure. Um, and then they showed us at the end of the season a full bin of, of the corn grain that they had harvested. And so it was really a boost um, in their production. So Joel, one of the things that I was thinking about is how Conrad said when he was here, people driving by fields using Farming God's Way are asking how they got those fields to look so good. Uh, in my own personal heart, I think it's just made me more um, compassionate. And I try to not, I mean, I'm not going in there as a savior or anything. Uh, I'm just sharing, I'm just going in sharing what I've learned and what I think might be helpful. You know, a lot of these people are subsistence farmers that aren't even making, producing enough um, to feed their own family. So if you can increase their production by five or 10 times or more, then not only are they, you know, able to store food for the dry season or for a drought, um, but they're also they're also able to sell some and make some income as well. So it really changes the entire family, you know, um, if they start using these principles. I mean, God is calling us all to reach out and touch somebody, whether that person's in another country or not. But, you know, if if you see the need and you feel the need, then that's probably an indication that God is calling you to do something about it. <laughs> So the first thing that happened is Pastor, well, we were riding to one of the faraway places and I saw people walking as far, this is on the third trip, people walking as far away as you could see and they were all coming to one little hole and I asked if we could stop and, and look. And way deep down in that one little hole was dirty water. And people were coming every day to get enough to survive. 
And we got back in the car and continued our trip. And I, I said, uh, this cannot be God's plan. There are several ways which you can search for water under the ground. And it all has to do with a magnetic field in the moving water. All moving water has some metal particles floating with it. About one in five human bodies have enough of a positive to negative electrical charge to help you attract the metal underground. And one of the tools that you can use for that is a plain old handsaw and you hold it on the blade end and you start walking slowly and when you find water the end of the saw will start to bounce. So it's going to be quicker to go over this way if you want to follow me, or if you walk, walk slowly. the arc makes of the saw, the more water there is below that. The well on the farm where I grew up needed to be replaced, so they had a well driller come in, and he drilled a well. I would run all the way home from school every day to watch this whole thing going on. I was so impressed with it. After a few days, they found water. And it was not a real good well. It didn't clear up. And then one time, suddenly there was a man standing on the yard with a handsaw. The well driller kind of looked at him like, who invited you? And my father was very protective, and he was kind of like, where'd you come from? And the man said, you're down about so deep for this well, right? And they said, yeah. And he said, well, you're about 30 feet shy of good water. And my dad shoot him off the yard. And then after about two years, that new well didn't work very well. So we got the well driller over there and they had the discussion and finally my dad said, you think that man with a handsaw knew anything? So the well driller pushed the well down another 30 feet and we had all kinds of water. At that time, as a kid, I built a little well drilling machine on my toy wagon and I went down where a stream was close by and drilled a hole and found water and I would bucket water out of my hole and I was pretty proud of myself until my dad found the holes and he didn't want his horses to step in them so I was out of the well business at about nine years old completely and that laid dormant for 50 years tell the Russia trip. I had heard that this man had built a prototype of a small rig that could fit on a pickup truck. And his vision was to teach people how to build that in their own countries. But so far he hadn't been very successful because they only wanted him to make a well. And what he wanted was to do education. And I had the equipment standing here I walked around it one day and I kind of looked up at it and I said, well, Lord, are we going to use this again or aren't we? And that was about a week before Deb Moore showed up. One day I'm driving past the road to Ina's store and I was clearly given the impression that this is the time to go ask him. I drove there and though he was retired, no surprise, he was there that day. And I said, would you, like, would you be willing to go with me? He did not know me. I did it's the first time I met him, and <clears throat> he said, would you like to see my prototype? And he drove me to the building you and I were in. 
if I'd have known you wanted to film this, I'd have cleaned it up a little better. <laughs> You have a piece of pipe under here. This hydraulic motor turns the pipe. And explained all the parts and the pieces and the process. And I understood none of it whatsoever. But I thought I must, must be interested because we're building a partnership here. One man came from the US with some equipment and some we bought here, some we traveled to Uganda to buy them. And that man trained our people. When I went the first time to Tanzania and walked out of the airport in Mwanza, here was Pastor Conrad looking at a snapshot that somebody had sent him of my thin carcass. And he said, ooh, there's, that's the one. That's the one. And then we started a trip cross country in a truck to go to Tanzania. However, the driver of the truck only assumed that he had to take us to Bacoba, not all the way to Gaeta. The result of that trip, in the words of my son-in-law, was, I have been on the road with you seven days I have slept in five different places and didn't have a bed the other two nights. And, but we finally arrived in uh, Ghetto to find, a, I don't know, 15 church leaders and I don't know how many had that had been sitting there for three days waiting for the arrival. I, I do not forget your message about the hairs on your head. <laughs> children and I don't know if you can describe that at all but hundreds of children in the Bible it says that the hairs of our head are numbered so to make a quick explanation for children you can say you know there's a God that loves you so much he knows how much hair you have so just rub your head and you you know you're loved I decided to use that along with passing out a piece of candy. And when I explained it to whoever the pastor was in the church and an elder that was there, they said, oh, we're going to have to do crowd control for you on this, or <laughs> this is going to be a mob. <laughs> so I want to remind you, you continue to believe that God is your father. And that he loves you tremendously. So all you have to do is rub your head. That God loves you. Now you can see the hair on his head. Now you can see the hair on his head. You know, the church only held 50, 60 adults and there was, yeah. And then they didn't know whose head to rub sometimes. So sometimes they're rubbing ours and said, you know, just to get your sweet. <laughs> yeah. You gave yeah. Them. These are different drill bits which spin around like this in the hole stir the soil loose, the water is pumped out the bottom and pushes up to take the material out. These things work in the United States, but they did not work in Africa because Africa has a solid layer of rock instead of many small rocks. We went back with this rig here. This is a small, what's called a rotary bit. And as it goes around, these wheels turn and these little pins are plated with diamond so that they can actually grind the rock up. And this is the type of bit we have to take to Africa to make a hole.
we ended up making a hole deep enough to find water. But we broke the pipes and we ran out of time and we never completed a well on the first trip. I remember when they lost the wellhead down in the hole, 20 or 30, 30 feet deep I believe it was. And uh, I had just talked at the church to get them to want to do wells. And we got the money, you know, what, what we needed to get going. And uh, Conrad wrote me one night, he said, we've lost the drill head. He says, 30 foot underground. And I'm, I'm sitting there wondering, I may, have to, I may have to leave this church now because I had talked him into you know, getting several thousand dollars came in to do this. And I may have to make a run for it because, you know, this is not going to play well. What I remember, how sad it was when they kept breaking. Everyone was so invested in it. Everything was going so well. Mm -hmm. And then the pipes would break. And the disappointment was palatable, can I say? I think tears sometimes. Um, yeah. yeah. It was just so hard to go home without a well the first time. Then I got the word on, uh, I believe it was. Sunday night or Monday morning, Conrad wrote me and he says, uh, he said the men stayed up all night, dug all the way down, 30 foot down, and retrieved the wellhead. And uh, it took about a million pounds off me. <laughs> you know, I could face people again. <laughs> And I was there with him, and I know they kept coming and saying, we can't pick you up yet, we can't pick you up yet. It was hours that passed the normal pickup. And it's because they were preparing that surprise for him. And so when we walked in the compound, and Sylvester had it, and um, I just remember Merle ran all the way across the compound, wrapped him in this huge bear hug, and everybody was weeping. And so, because we all thought, everyone thought, it's gone. Ni namna gani imeendelea kwa upande wako? Upande wangu imeendelea vizuri baada ya kuwa amekuja amefundisha tumeelewa namna ya ku set machine alizo tupatia smart gun ukaendelea na ule ujuzi aliyotupatia na kweli ule ujuzi una ufanisi mzuri ndipo kuwa wakati mwingine unakuwa na changamoto mbalimbali. Is something wrong? It's okay. It's okay. All right. It takes a while to be clean maybe. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> what do I do? <laughs> Whoa. Whoa! We have water! Okay. You want to plug out? <laughs> yes. Yes. Thank you! I'm going to use a load because I'm going to put it in the water. Nice and clean now. I want to call Merle and tell him what you did. Nataka kumpigia mal mere zitu nasema ni muambie iki mulicho fanya. We will try today. Taja aribu leo. That first well when we did that and I drank a cup of water out of it, the people backed up. Right. You know, like I was going to fall down dead of poisoning because yes. they never drank a cup of water out of a well. Right, right. So. And then he started pouring it on their heads with a pitcher. <laughs> and they've never had that experience because there's not much water, you don't waste it. Mm -hmm. So that became a tradition. You have to do that every time a well was inaugurated. At one place in Musalala when I was there, they call them inaugurations, the well inauguration. 
<clears throat> before we even finished the service on that day, I could see out the church window women coming with the tall things on their head to fill them with clean water and just laughing joyously as they were pumping clean, fresh water. <laughs> This is one of the earlier wells, finished in 2015. With the help of the repair teams in Africa, it continues to provide clean water to over 500 families every day. I was told that sometimes the line stretches into the hills, people walking as far as the eye can see to get clean, life-giving water. But this seems only a glimpse of what's truly possible. Um, kulingana na jamii inayotuzunguka katika jamii yetu ya Tanzania visima ni vichache na watu ni wengi wanaohitaji maji hilo ndio la kwanza labda unaweza kufa fasili baada ya When Conrad was planning, we were planning his trip, I said, are there things you would like to see? And he said, I'm not coming to be a tourist, I'm coming to work. And I suggested we should at least see Lake Michigan and the Mackinac Bridge. So here they are on a very snowy February Sunday afternoon, <laughs> getting this iconic shot of the Mackinac Bridge. It's our second attempt. The first time we tried, there was a blizzard in Gaylord. We had to turn around and come back. And it was quite cute because he said, I have a new word, blizzard. In January of 2023, Pastor Conrad and his wife Margaret came to America to visit the Everett Free Methodist Church. They met with Jerry and Carol Reedy, Merle and Thelma Smulligan, Joel and Cara Clifton, Pastor Russ and Carol Atherton, and with me as well. Pastor Conrad gave messages and went on a statewide thank you tour, meeting the people face to face that he had worked with for so many years. And I told my wife, Daddy has found me and asking me if we are ready to, to visit them in, in her country. She told me, oh. Are you telling me the truth? And I, I said, yes. This is how she has told me. Conrad and Margaret brought lots of gifts to give their partners, the kitengi cloth and the tea sets. They traveled with seven suitcases. Only one had their thanks. The rest were gifts. And, and so when, when we went up to the Everett for the, for the gathering, you know, I didn't realize that my being there had really that much significance at all. But the, the gratitude and, uh, and the gift that Pastor Conrad and his wife shared with us, that was, that was very humbling. In fact, we took that, it was that custom printed material, and we took it home, and I thought, what are we gonna do with this? I hated to, to cut it up, you know, to, to make garments or something like that. You know, some of you were able to do that, and I, I couldn't do that. And so, it's in our house, and it's, and it's draped over a, a, a bureau, a buffet, in our uh, living room. We had uh, relatives over a few weeks ago and, and they noticed that that cloth and, and on the cloth they had about uh, the association of the Everett Church and, and the, uh, the folks in Africa and about the wells and about helping the handicapped and uh, had pictures of Bibles on it, you know, the, so understanding all the Bibles that had been made possible. And I don't remember, there were some other things on it. People would look at that and say, what is this? And so we, we said, well, we got a chance to be part of something really great. And it continues to be great and greater. And of course, only God knows how good it's going to get. But the story spreads and spreads and spreads. You know, so. Again, over and over, he said, some people have been to our country and loved us, but we thought it was just them. 
but we are loved every place we have gone. So the thank yous, like the Rotary Club said, we really get feedback from across town. And he has come 7,000 miles to say thank you and show us the results of our early donation to help with the preschool. So I think that was everyone's attitude. It's just touching to be able to face-to-face -face meet with someone. You know, and, and that's with this kind of stuff, you know, that, well, it's just a water well. Uh, you know, God makes a way more than a water well. You know, like friends that we have, you know, all are way more than friends. You know, and in the kingdom of God, it just goes way, way beyond that. And we don't yet know how good that is. <laughs> During their visit, the idea to make this documentary began to be conceived, but more footage from Africa was needed. So Deb Boer, along with her friends Vicky and Bev, packed up and took my camera across the sea to Africa. They were also able to take more well parts from Merle to provide even more fresh water to the people there. The people in Tanzania showed abundant kindness as the three ladies went on a tour of their own. And when I was growing up, my parents uh, told me, we see you like to teach others, maybe you will become a pastor. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, I don't know. Even my parents have been telling me uh, that since I was little, I like to help people. And then when I was to the Bible college, I like too much to study about God, but also to help people with the different challenges, not only to know God, but different challenges. One thing that was important to us while making this documentary 
was to avoid painting Americans as the saviors who did all the work. None of these projects would have been possible without the willingness and the capabilities of the Tanzanian people. Any efforts would have only reached a fraction of their true potential if they had not been carried on by the newly educated locals. This knowledge and strength only had to be passed along to them in order to begin the change. Our people has been training how to do other, some things themselves, such like at the well project, they know how to use the machines, the rig, and we, we started with the one team, and since we have been continuing with that project, then we have two teams for World War III. More than 24 churches. In more than 15 World Wellies, but also Bible College for training our people, but also preschool. 3,000, just at first I thought 3,000 converts, but then Jerry corrected me, he's like, no, 3,000 members. There's like a lot more converts. <laughs> and um, 17 wells, 11,000 pounds of food, thousands of Bibles. Did you have a feeling that something like this large scale was gonna be happening when Jerry first came to your office and you first got involved? Yeah, you probably can suspect. No, <laughs> no, when Jerry, uh, first came in with this, you know, I had no clue what it was going to become. And I suspect that happens a lot in, in the kingdom of God. You know, when he works with people, uh, they have no clue uh, what they're beginning, what they're on the ground floor of, of producing. And, uh, and I, you know, and I always felt like I have such a little, little piece of this. Jerry is a very key part of it. And uh, of course, you know, Jerry would probably defer to the folks in Africa. He says, all I do is I send the resources and they're the ones that are really doing the work. And uh, I think it emphasizes, you know, in the, in, it's in Corinthians where Paul talks about the body of Christ. You know, each piece has a role to play. And, and, uh, and I think this is one of those opportunities we just kind of all played our role and did the thing that God had for us to do. Kwa watu ambao wana tusikiliza, kuambia. Naweza kuacha ujumbe kwamba bado tuna mahitaji mengi waendelee kutusaidia wasichoke na waendelee kuwa na moyo kama huo huo ambao walikuwa wakitusaidia hapo nyuma na mpaka kufikia hii katika hali hii tuliyonayo ambayo ni nzuri kuliko nyuma. Kwa hiyo Mungu awabariki kabisa waendelee kwa na moyo huo. Tusaidiane kwa pamoja, mtusaidie. Na kanisa yetu kale kapanuke. Kawe kazuri. Na ile shule ya watoto na yeye muitengeneze tuitengeneze kwa pamoja kwa kushirikiana iwe mazali nzuri kusudi tupate watoto wengi tuendelee kupata sio sisi ambayo tulianzisha ndio tuwemo na watoto wetu sawa so. <laughs> During the first week of Pastor Conrad's visit, um, I was tasked with making a video um, with the footage he brought from Africa um, to tell the story of what had happened in 15 years of, of partnership. Um, I had about 10 hours to get it done before it was supposed to be shown the next Sunday morning. I got to sit down and pull a very long editing session and see this entire story of 15 years in about 10 hours. And it was incredible to watch and I felt called to make a documentary that was actually, you know, telling the, the, the real full story all in one place with, with all the participants. That was a very exciting idea to me for about two days. And then I realized the insane amount of work that that would take to actually do. 
There was about 50,000 files on these. Um, we had a stack of CDs like that that we lost, but there was two or three days of videos on those that we saved off of them. And um, I told Deb, we absolutely have to get a picture of all of these files together because I was amazed when I saw them. I just wanted to show everybody that this documentary is being filmed by, by many people before I even got involved. So um, many thanks to Pastor Conrad and Isaac and Deb for all of their filming and whoever else took part in filming 15 years of history um, for me to go through. I actually kind of enjoyed it. And yet I couldn't deny that I was still feeling called to put together the project in spite of all the work. So what I ended up doing was to help myself along, I asked each of the participants at the end of their interviews a veiled kind of question from myself. And it was, if you knew someone who was struggling with what God had called them to do, what would your advice be to that person? And this is how they all responded. Many people hide from doing a good work because they say, oh, they might not appreciate it or they won't use it. Go in the faith of what you're going to do and not try to judge what the results might be. On the way, I will admit, while I was flying on the plane, I said, what am I doing? Am I prepared for this? And when we got to Mwanza, and we got to the bus station, and I saw all those people, and smelled the smells, and heard the noise, and it was so hot. Again, I said, what am I doing here? <laughs> but by the time we got to their house, it was fine. I'm glad my husband encouraged me. The first time he went, he said, I will take you back there sometime. And I'm glad he did. Well, it's probably the best thing you could ever do for yourself, for your life, is to say yes. So if you had the chance to, to move away and live in what you thought you wanted in your, your retirement plan, you would, you would give that all up to do this again? Oh yeah, this this house is more comfortable than that house would have ever been. <laughs> I would just say, you know, get deeper into the Word, get deeper into prayer, you know, communicate with the Holy Spirit. You know, if your heart's for traveling to another country, that's awesome. Um, but if if you you know can support something, I, I keep seeing the church in decline. But at the same time. Um, I see a lot of very faithful people going out and touching lives all over the world. So uh, I would just encourage people to get involved in what the Lord is doing because it's happening all over the place. Number one, do like Jerry did. He came and talked to me, you know, find the counsel of, of somebody that you know is strong spiritually and is looking at God. Uh, so you can clarify whether it's the God thing. Um, and the second thing I would say is um, catalog through your excuses not to. You know, one of the things that I, I could hear Jerry saying, you know, is uh, I, I just don't have any reasons why I can't or why I shouldn't. You know, it sounds crazy, but uh, I can't say no to it. And I know for me personally, that was my call to ministry was, you know, I, this isn't what I dreamed to do to make my life a life of you know ministry in the, in the way that I did. Uh, I had other plans for my life, you know, all through the scripture. Anybody who ever tried to say no to God, find out you no, you don't say no to God. Um, if you have any uh, reserves or any questions or any doubts about it, uh, get them clarified. Because you know, any time that I face the hard stuff through the years of ministry, I go back. Uh, to a little place called Mullican, Michigan, my hometown, and 117 French Street, second story, uh, the bedroom that I shared with my two brothers. 
And I remember sitting on my bed. That was the only private place I had. And uh, my first prayer was, God, if you're real, please help me to understand because I, I, can't, I can't get this. Uh, I tried and tried and tried. And I think the same kind of experience that Jerry has got impressed on me. And it was an indelible impression, uh, an undeniable impression. And I think anytime we're sensing that God might be talking to us, we need to make it clear so that, you know, that's, that's been, let's see, that's been over 60 years ago. So for over 60 years of my life, that's been a stabilizing all through everything I've ever done. You know, the, the biggest decisions of my life, the biggest difficulties of my life, the biggest expenses of my life, all that stuff, you know, goes back to what happened on that little prayer. And, and I, think, I think we need to understand uh, what prayer is, you know, as far as making that contact with God and, and uh, letting Him deal with all of our doubts. Because I think the thing that happens to people is, is they're afraid to totally open up to God because they don't know if they can trust Him. And that's really bad theology. You know, I, somewhere I have to come to trust somebody. And who better to trust than God? If it's a fleeting thought and it's something you've always wanted to do, well, you have right to question that. But that was not at all the case for me. It lasted for a year, lasted for another six months. And it wasn't something I wanted to do. A friend of mine looked at an album I made on one of my trips and she was flipping pages. Someone I worked with in hospice a long time ago. I said, what are you looking for? And she said, you look the same on every page. And I thought she meant I look sick because I was very sick and lost quite a bit of weight. And um, I said, yeah, I know I was sick a lot of the time and you can see. And she said, no, no. She said, your face is glowing on every page. And it's because I had embraced the joy at that point of being in the place where I was supposed to be. So that's what I would say. Don't, yeah, don't let your, your excuses um, stop you from moving. Take the next step. Take the next step. I have witnessed many things happen in this partnership, which even myself, I didn't trust or I didn't believe they could happen. But finally, I found that God created people in good condition and asked people to love each other and work together for each other. So my message to people is if someone has called to serve God, he or she could not fear because he or she has been called to serve God's people and God will be with him or she to accomplish to accomplish what God himself wants. So can you show us maybe the shop where they were made? I can, you'd probably be disappointed. <laughs> Not very good on stairs anymore. About well, 35 different woods I use. So these are all in progress then, huh? Right. Those back there are clocks. Oh yeah, I can see that. Ten hours, eight, ten hours to build one. Restoring five to ten. Could you always do it that quick or did it take you longer in the beginning? Well, you didn't know nothing at the beginning. <laughs> That's what those boxes look like when they're done, see? Well, 
It's got the book, book match bottom. It's Hawaiian koa. Mm. Rare stuff. So who taught you how to do the woodworking? Me. <laughs> you just learned on your own, huh? Well, I went to woodshop when I was in high school. Mm. From there on, I made a lot of mistakes and kept on going. Bird's eye maple. Another tough one. Yeah, you know, it took me 30 years or more to build this wood pile, and it looks like it's easy, but you know, you buy this here one piece at a time. Yeah. When you see one that's worth having. You know, like you look here, underneath here, you see all them pieces of stuff. Well, I gotta trim it all up put it in them boxes and then I make, I got enough there to make 50 or 60 of them or maybe even a hundred. Mm. All the participants agreed that they had not planned on anything like this. And yet, a plan had become obvious. The plan of one who cared for women, children, and the disabled, and brought so many people together of one who brought life-giving water to those who thirsted, of a shepherd that guided his flock with words of truth, of a husbandman who tended to his fields until they were ripe for harvest, of a patient friend who offered support when things got hard, and of a carpenter that built his church slowly and surely, taking unassuming scraps and shaping them into what they were always meant to be. This person seemed familiar. Each of the people I spoke to seemed to look like him and glow with his joy and peace. I learned to know this planner as the one who could take a young boy's gift of stickers and transform it into a feature film. But do not doubt that he will be able to do abundantly more with your gift if you are willing to listen to his voice and follow him out onto the water. I didn't take the lens cover off. This is my father's world. Its king shall say to thee, through the least of these, you have cared for me. Come join my kingdom's peace. This is my father's world. The battle is not done. Mercy's river runs from his loving son. This one is interesting, it's a Merle. One of his gifts is he can sleep anywhere. And this is a very small bench in the compound. And he had a nice rest right there. When you video, when you video, Since I'm recording. Do not doubt that we'll be able to do one of the 
around. 